Um, we are going to have a lot of talks today about uh, nuts and bolts issues of community building and unique perspectives on community building, but I'm going to give a little bit of a, a sort of an artistic uh, spiritual overview. Um, informed a little bit more by uh, a little bit more by experience than by numbers. I don't have very good data on these things. All I have is the the, uh, the sort of observations, the um, the time spent on the road, the uh, uh, the artist's experience of synthesizing um, what they're learning from the communities around them. And so I'm going to give you a lot of uninformed um, prejudicial judgments and you can feel free to take or leave them as you choose. Um, over the last year, um, I have been, uh, let's see, I toured 50 states. Um, on the lower right is a map that I actually was challenged to hand draw in uh, three minutes or less in Iowa, competing with two other girls. My apologies to, I believe, Alabama, Rhode Island, and uh, New Hampshire, which were left out, I believe. And Michigan appears twice in Michigan and in Mississippi. Um, I'm sorry for that, but I can do it perfectly now <laughs> after traveling to all 50 states. And in my defense, both the Iowa girls left out Alaska and Hawaii, so. Um, we call this also the making first impression uninformed judgments about communities across the US tour because I would effectively arrive in a town, spend one day, two days, or even five hours there sometimes, and um, essentially spend my time wondering and thinking about how it was like or different from every other city in the United States. I made a list and it was only about 40 cities long of large metro areas that I did not see. These were the largest cities on it. But um, I've, sp I've, I've been to pretty much everywhere else that I'm allowed to live legally without a visa. And I have uninformed judgments about it all. Um, hopefully this is useful to um, useful to some of you in the sense that um, I think that there's a lot to be learned from how outsiders see our community. You all know the experience of having someone else come into Anchorage and wanting to show them around town and wanting to give them the impression that we, um, in fact, do have electricity, running water, and fantastic food. Um, and in, in effect, defending our community to an outsider. This was more or less my route. Um, and Everywhere I went, I was accommodated by friends from Twitter. Uh, probably about 90% friends from Twitter and about 10% friends that I knew previously. Um, I only have one thing to say about Twitter, and that is that even though it is conducted in 140 character short bursts, the relationships formulated on it are very, very real. And so anyone who has, um, anyone who has allegations of, pardon me, my phone is going off. Don't you dare. Ah. Um, <laughs> anyone who has allegations that Twitter is um, an unimportant or a, uh, or a trite or trivial medium um, would have, I would have a beef with them because I met and hugged and made friends with hundreds and hundreds of friends who I met only in 140 character bursts and found their characters to be deeply revealed in what they choose to say in those short sentences. I also found that they were very, very excited to show me around where they lived. They gave me the tourist view of the town. You all know what you do when you take people around to Anchorage, right? There are certain places you go. They're the non-missables. Um, and uh, that's what I got from them. I noticed, though, that they never took me to uh, Panera. They took me to their local incredible custom grilled cheese sandwich shop that I'd never seen the like of before. They didn't take me to see art at Ikea. They took me to see the statue of Michelangelo's David, which oddly enough resides in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and causes some controversy due to being naked and uh, near the freeway in the park. They couldn't decide which side should be facing the freeway because both were equally offensive. Um, they took me to see the things that you can't see anywhere else, the things that they felt differentiated their city from the ones around it. And we had lively conversations about um, what they thought of other states, what they thought of other cities, what other cities thought of them, what made them unique. Um, I, one of my favorite games was the ninth grade state history recall game, meaning I sit around in a circle with beer with a bunch of people from Indianapolis or somewhere, and I say, so tell me about your state's history. And they all had to think back because they knew national history, they knew national issues, and either they would have a long argument based upon trying to remember what they learned back in their state history class, or else stitch together from NPR stories that they'd been listening to on their local station. Um, this amused me to no end. But um, it gave me a deep sense of how important it was um, for them to communicate the uniqueness of their town to me, including when they didn't like their town. 
They weren't going to tell me, though, what they had in common with everyone else. They were going to take me to the local spot that no one else had anything like. They were going to take me to find the original Philly cheesesteak, even though I understand it has something like Cheese Whiz on it, which was not my favorite thing. They were going to take me to the place where they made the first this and the first that, and where they still make it that way, and where you can't get it in any other place. Um, I loved that. That's what I love to, when people come to Anchorage. That's how I want them to think of my city. Um, uh, one of my other favorite things was actually that now I have a connection to street names all over the country, all over the continent, to White Ave in Edmonton, and to um, Soho in New York, and to, um, oh, to Bourbon Street in New Orleans, to all these places that you, you think of the name and your heart warms. Um, that doesn't usually happen with um, something like Airport Heights or Walmart Way or what have you. You understand. People don't have the same connection to businesses that are large. Nothing against businesses that are large. We're not going to rant against big business. But um, what the way that people see their own city is really about what exists there and nowhere else. It's really about small business. It's about arts. It's about what makes it unique. Unique is valuable. Um, that, is, that is what people think of in terms of their spiritual connection to their community. And I mean the word spiritual, not in the sense uh, strictly of religious, but meaning things that have value to the spirit, things that matter to us in the currency of the spirit, um, which is what I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, I had a, sort of a dual road trip experience. One was arriving in town and being warmly welcomed by locals. The other was having the road warrior experience. And this is terrible. This is why people who tour all the time go insane and, and keel over after a couple of years. Um, I spent, I drove about 35,000 miles, mostly highway. Um, and I loved it, but my right leg is permanently kinked in this position. And uh, highways afford you some beautiful views and some of the most horrific food on the planet because it is the same everywhere you go and it is the same, um, it, it is very difficult sometimes to find fresh fruit if you're spending a whole day on the highway that actually tastes like anything. It is very difficult to find a beverage that does not have lots of extra sugar in it and it is definitely hard to find something locally made, especially on a big long stretch through the American West. Um, if you're lucky, and sometimes I was, you find a roadside stand or you find a little diner and you take your chances. But it is taking a chance, in fact, because you're not sure whether the quality of what you're going to get is consistent, whether it's edible, whether it's going to give you food poisoning. And sometimes there are senses in which when you're in a hurry and you've got to be somewhere, you can't quite take a risk on a small business. And in those senses, I became grateful for the consistency of the chains that I saw, because I knew if I did go to a Panera, I knew that I would get something reasonable for X price, and it would probably taste like this, and it probably would not kill me. Um, which, considering some of the diners I nearly went to, um, that's a trade I'm willing to make. But um, uh, one of the other things I noticed was uh, chain stores locally that hope to go national. There's much talk of in and out going to Texas, which is a big, big, big thing. And it was fun to be like, oh, hey, I'm in caribou coffee country. I'm, I'm seeing the caribou coffee chains here. Oh, hey, I'm back in Seattle's best coffee country. Oh, hey, you know, but gradually these things are creeping more and more. There's kind of an essential difference between the businesses that want to have five outlets in their town or two outlets in their town, like Atomic Coffee and Fargo Moorhead, and chains that want to gradually sprawl all over the country and we'll take every opportunity to do so. Um, and I'm not going to make a value judgment on that, but I am going to say that they are deeply different experiences. And when I went to Chicago, um, what, eight years ago, people were very excited to take me to Caribou Coffee. And no, nobody cares to take me to Caribou Coffee. There's a big difference. Um, so we judge our community, we judge other communities and our own community by its unique character. And we're likely, in our own community, if we like it, to um, give it the benefit of the doubt in that we describe it by its small businesses, even if 90% of the real estate might be taken up by big businesses that have no added spiritual value. Um, because um, forces, businesses and forces and um, objects, traded in a community have both market value and spiritual value. These are not a dichotomy. It's not like they have one or the other. But, um, but every, every object sold, every store you go into, sort of um, embodies some combination of those two factors. By spiritual value, you, you can tell an item that has high spiritual value, I think, because we're uncomfortable dealing with how to pay for it. 
um, we have this kind of notion that if something has a very high spiritual value, introducing money into the equation is problematic. Hence the words like Philistine or sellout. These words would not exist except that something in us feels like treating an object with very high spiritual value, say um, a religious item or art or dance or, um, or a really moving spiritual experience, counseling, say, uh, treating one of those in the same way that we treat a trash can or something we buy at the hardware store or a burger, um, that doesn't quite feel right. But the thing is, we imbue these objects with value ourselves, with spiritual value. Um, oh my goodness, my time is going quickly. That's all right, here we go. Um, I'm an artist, so I trade on spiritual value. That gives me a complicated relationship with what I do. We're gonna skip ahead a little bit. I have a problem because of the internet. The current market value of what I do is zero dollars. Um, the current market value of my product is zero dollars, meaning people can get it for free and they will get it for free. And I can try and go get a paid gig, but those are disappearing because bands are willing to play for zero dollars. So the value of what I'm doing is going away. Um, the way that I fight this is by having to bring up intentionally and repeatedly the spiritual value of what I do. I'm basically on an educational mission in order to get paid because I'm having to let people know they don't have to pay me for what I do anymore. They can get it for free. But it has a value that is unrelated to its market value, and that's a spiritual value. And if I can communicate to an audience that that matters to them and that that is a part of the community that they need to see alive, then um, they may be willing to pay for voluntarily what they don't have to pay for to access it anymore. There's no gateway to the access. It's all about people choosing to pay me for what I do because it doesn't cost. It doesn't cost anything, the free market says. Um, a community can do the same thing. A community is now sort of in the awkward position of um, attempting to convince people that the things that give their community value, the things that make their community unique, which may not be the most marketable, your ballet, your opera, your historic preservations of buildings, the Fourth Avenue Theater, for example, some of these things are not profitable. And yet having them in a community is what gives it value to us. And so inspiring in people the notion that um, the spiritual value of these things is more important than their market value in some cases in order to have the kind of community that we want is uh, currently the mission that I'm on and the mission that a lot of other artists and journalisms are on. In other words, it's our city, it's our problem. Anything that we want to see happen is our responsibility. Um, This is what I've been trying to tell people all across the country, and this is what I would like to tell people here. Someone fought to create or preserve everything awesome and enriching about your city. If there's something you love in your city, someone worked hard to compel it to happen. A group worked hard to compel it to happen. And if something awesome was kept out of your city, the same is true. And the odds are that right now someone is probably fighting, might be the same person, might be someone else, to remind you that it's awesome and that it's worth paying for and should stay alive. Um, only if it's really awesome, of course. But those people who are fighting to give you the notion that things in your city have spiritual value are the ones we should be listening to, and they're the ones that we should be. It's really up to us to make sure that the things that we care most about um, endure. And I think, in fact, that if we do care about these things, we do prioritize them, they will bring prosperity to our community. Good arts communities draw a lot of money. They draw a lot of good things. Um, they could draw people who will be invested in the community. And the last thing I wish to say is that having gone everywhere that I can go without a visa, these are some images from some of my favorite small businesses and unique experiences in Anchorage. Um, having visited everywhere I want to go without a visa, I want to live in Anchorage because I feel like it's a city that is open to fighting for unique experiences and preserving unique experiences that is open to a single person making an effort to keep these things alive and getting involved on the most elementary level. It's very, very easy to do, and that's what makes Anchorage livable for me over every other city in the entire United States. So thank you so much for being here today. I hope that you continue to be inspired and engaged. Get involved.